AMD's new Zen 5 Ryzen 9000 processors are just around the corner and today we can reveal a little more information about them. Actually, not as much information as I was expecting given these parts are just about to hit store shelves, but hopefully there's enough here to tide you over until you can purchase a new Zen 5 CPU. So as a recap, AMD announced the Ryzen 9000 series at Computex last month. This included four main desktop processors in a pretty standard lineup, the Ryzen 9 9950X, Ryzen 9 9900X, Ryzen 7 9700X, and Ryzen 5 9600X. The main benefit we're getting here is a 16% average IPC uplift, similar to AMD's previous Zen architecture upgrades. Other areas to the design remain unchanged from Ryzen 7000, including the number of CPU cores, which is still between 6 and 16 across the lineup, and peak frequencies that push up to 5.7 GHz. There's also no 3D vCache models as of yet, meaning the initial batch of Zen 5 CPUs top out at 32 MB of L3 cache per CCD. We now have a release date for these processors, July 31st, 2024, right at the end of AMD's initial July release window. What we don't have though is pricing, which is a bit strange to be honest. AMD are going to begin selling these processors in just over two weeks time, and there's no indication of how much they'll cost or how much buyers will need to save up to grab Zen 5. In contrast, when Zen 4 was announced in 2022, we had full pricing and spec information nearly a month before launch. But I also, I really don't know what this means or how much to read into it. Usually when a company doesn't want to divulge specific information, it's because the answer isn't very positive. Most of the Zen 4 lineup is now discounted below its initial launch MSRP, sometimes by hundreds of dollars, like the 7900X, which you can grab right now for just $360 US. So early pricing comparisons to full MSRP Zen 5 models might not be all that favorable. But it could also be the case where pricing is quite competitive and AMD doesn't want to cannibalize Zen 4 sales over the next few weeks. Apparently, we will get pricing in time for reviews, but right now, we're still in the dark. What we are getting today are more first-party performance slides. Back at Computex, we got very limited performance info, mostly focusing on the Ryzen 9 9950X compared to the Core i9 14900K from Intel. Now AMD are expanding these comparisons to include the other models. Most of these slides are pretty typical in the information they provide. The six games shown for each comparison are the same across all models. AMD are advertising that the 9950X is on average 13% faster than the 14900K for gaming across these titles, though as always, first-party benchmarks should be taken with a grain of salt due to the level of cherry-picking that may be occurring with just six titles. With the Ryzen 9 9900X, AMD is suggesting 12% more performance than the 14900K, which should mean very similar gaming performance to the 16-core model. With the 9700X, AMD are now comparing to the 14700K, again showing a 13% performance improvement for the Zen 5 part. The 9600X is expected to be 14% faster than the Core i5-14600K going off this data as well. What's perhaps more interesting are the productivity numbers, which appear to be more significantly cherry-picked. For example, with the 9900X versus 14900K, AMD show Blender as one example of greater performance, but with the 6 and 8 core models, that benchmark is swapped out for 7-zip, usually quite a favorable benchmark for AMD CPUs. There's also a heavy focus on single-threaded results like Procyon Office, Geekbench, and Photoshop, as opposed to multi-core tasks outside of Handbrake, which is expected to benefit significantly from Zen 5's AVX512 support. Reading between the lines, this suggests Ryzen 9000 CPUs might not be as competitive for multi-threaded workloads compared to single-threaded workloads relative to the nearest Intel parts. E-cores are a significant part of Intel's architecture that assist massively with multi-threaded productivity apps. The 14700K features 12 E-cores in addition to 8 P-cores, and the 14600K gives you a 6P plus 8E configuration. This will likely see Intel maintain their multi-core productivity lead. Previously, we found the 14 600K to be over 50% faster than the Ryzen 5 7600X in some workloads like Cinebench Multicore, which is a huge gap to bridge in a generation that sees no increase to core count. 
AMD also compared the Ryzen 7 9700X to the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D, claiming the new Zen 5 part is 12% faster on average than first-gen 3D vCached models while using less power. This is an interesting comparison given it's effectively Zen 5 versus Zen 3, not a comparison to the newer Zen 4-based 7800X 3D. However, AMD did also mention to us that a similar comparison to the 7800X 3D would show the new 9700X coming in a couple of percentage points faster. So that's interesting to note. All of these claims don't fully align with our current CPU gaming data, which found that the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D is a little slower than typical Zen 4 non-X3D processors. 4% faster for the 7600X versus 5800X 3D, and 8% faster comparing 7700X versus 5800X 3D. There is little to no crossover in the games tested between our test suite and AMD's, and we use an RTX 4090, while AMD typically uses a Radeon RX 7900 XTX, but this would imply only a small increase to gaming performance for the 9700X over the 7700X. At the same time, for the 9700X to be 13% faster than the 14700K across a range of games, it would actually be faster than the 7800X 3D in our data and over 30% faster than the 5800X 3D. It's hard to know exactly where things will land given AMD do claim the 9700X is slightly faster than the 7800X 3D. I guess you shouldn't really trust first party benchmarks, but if this were to be true, the gap to the 5800X 3D would have to be bigger, making at least one of the claims AMD has made a bit contradictory to the others and our testing at least. With all of that said, AMD did compare Ryzen 9000 to Ryzen 7000 directly in Blender multi-thread, claiming a variety of performance gains while also boasting lower TDPs. But there's an important reminder here, TDPs are not an actual measurement of power consumption, merely a rating for required cooler performance. Just because the Ryzen 5 model drops from a 105W TDP to a 65W TDP while improving performance by 17% doesn't mean the actual power consumption of those parts has decreased by 40 watts. The 105W TDP processor previously might very well have not been using all of that power. So what else is new to learn about Zen 5 processors? Well, firstly, AMD are expecting decent gains from using Precision Boost Overdrive, especially for the Ryzen 7 9700X. There have been some rumors claiming that AMD were going to raise the TDP of the 9700X at the last minute from 65 watts to something higher, like 120 watts, but this is not the case based on the information AMD is showing just two weeks out from launch. Instead, AMD are claiming that due to lower default TDPs, PBO is going to provide more extra headroom than usual, especially for the 9700X, where they are claiming a 15% performance increase from this feature. Ryzen 9000 processors will run cooler than Ryzen 7000 due to a 15% improvement in thermal resistance, which AMD claim will result in a 7 degrees Celsius temperature reduction at the same level of power consumption. Generally, Zen 4 processors were easy to cool due to only moderate power usage, especially compared to Intel's 14th gen, but they did run upwards of 90 degrees Celsius under full load. This is a nice benefit for people that are temperature sensitive and worried about cooking their CPUs, and it should also allow CPU free frequencies to run higher at a given temperature. There are additional overclocking enhancements, especially for memory. Base JEDEC memory support has increased from DDR5 5200 in Zen 4 to DDR5 5600, and there's OC support up to DDR5 8000, which AMD tells me is actually achievable in real-world workloads, but the sweet spot will be a bit lower. But the most interesting inclusion here is something called Memory Optimized Performance Profile. Basically what this means is that memory frequencies and timings can be adjusted on the fly and depending on the workload. This allows the benefits of high frequency memory and low latency memory without needing to constantly tweak things in the BIOS. The way it was explained is that if you purchase a high-end memory kit, e.g. DDR5-8000, in some workloads it would push the frequency right up to 8000 speed at looser timings like CL38, because usually when running at higher speeds, you can't have super tight timings. But then for some games as an example, the system will automatically lower the frequency and tighten timings if necessary. That way your DDR5-8000 kit might actually be beneficial across a broad range of use cases instead of being a bit useless for gaming due to looser timings and worse latency. We'll have to see how effective it is and how well it tunes memory on the fly, but it sounds pretty promising. 
For processor overclocking, there's also an evolution of the Curve Optimizer feature called Curve Shaper, which allows for more control over the voltage frequency curves at differing operating temperatures. AMD made several deeper disclosures on the Zen 5 architecture, though we don't really do architecture deep dives here at Hardware Unboxed, so check out some of the other great channels that will go into detail on this. However, the highlights here are a full 512-bit data path for AVX512 instructions, an increase in the L1 data cache from 32KB 8-way to 48KB 12-way, a doubling of the maximum L1 cache bandwidth, and better branch prediction. There's an increase from 6-wide dispatch in Zen 4 to 8 8 wide dispatch, an increase in ALUs from 4 to 6, and there's now a dual decoding pipeline in the front end. This is how AMD sees each of these architectural improvements impacting the final IPC and overall performance. The big driver of gains has been the improvements to execution and decoding, with data bandwidth also a significant factor. AMD has announced two new chipsets joining the 800 series. At Computex, we got X870 and X870E as flagship chipsets and saw plenty of new boards across the various vendors. Now AMD are also disclosing the widely rumoured B850 and B840 chipsets with a breakdown seen in this handy table. The basics are that X870 and X870E mandate USB 4 and PCI 5.0 for graphics and the primary M.2 slot. B850 reduces the requirements for both to USB 3.2 20 gigabits per second and PCI 5.0 for just the primary NVMe drive with 5.0 for graphics being optional. B840 cuts things back further, only supporting PCI 3.0 instead of 4.0 as the baseline, dropping USB 3.2 support down to 10 gigabits per second, and removing Moving support for CPU overclocking. So where do things fall compared to the existing 600 series? Well, X870 and X870E are a step up from the X670 series in that all boards now support USB 4 and the non-E boards will have more PCI 5.0 connectivity. B850 is a mixture of B650 and B650E, but mostly a refresh of that chipset. B840 ends up a tier below A620 in some areas, while both chipsets drop support for CPU overclocking and reduce USB speeds to 10 gigabits per second, B840 further reduces the PCIe bus to 3.0, whereas A620 remains PCIe 4.0. With that said, other aspects of B840 could end up a tier above A620, such as the number of USB ports that are supported, which isn't listed in the chart. All 600 series chipsets do support memory overclocking, so that's good to see. AMD also says that new boards have improved memory routing to allow for more reliable memory performance at higher speeds, like DDR5-8000 that was previously mentioned, although we'll have to see which boards receive these improvements and how well it works. However, as mentioned at Computex, these new 800 series motherboards will not be released alongside Zen 5, instead coming several months later. So at launch, it'll be performance on the 600 series boards. Finally, we also got a roadmap update, if you can call it that, with this slide featuring Zen 6 on it. Absolutely zero other details, so it's really just a hype slide to be honest, no indication of when we can expect Zen 6 or what sort of process node it's using, just nothing here to go on whatsoever, which is a little laughable. All AMD has said is that Zen 6 is on track, whatever that means. The gap between Zen 3 and Zen 4 was roughly 22 months, and there's the same 22 month gap between Zen 4 and Zen 5. Based on that, we should expect Zen 6 in May of 2026, and that is of course a complete guess. And that does it for today's Zen 5 news. In just a few weeks, you should see our full reviews of these processes, along with plenty of follow-up content in the months to follow. Still disappointing that we don't have any pricing information for Ryzen 9000, but we do know these parts are arriving on July 31st, so look out for everything around then. And that's it for this one. If you do want to get our Ryzen 9000 CPU reviews in your inbox as soon as they hit, then please do subscribe to the Hardware Unbox channel. That's the best way to get that information to you as soon as possible. If you do want to support the channel directly and the work that we do here, then please consider supporting us via Patreon or Floatplane. Links to those are in the description below, and you gain access to some cool bonus features like our BTS content and our Discord chat, which is a great place to chat about all the latest tech. So thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.